Welcome to Pushing the Envelope, Passive House Construction in the Hudson Valley. This conversation is an exploration of the ideas and concepts in our third annual Passive House Guide, which was recently published in the spring issue of Upstate House. Produced in partnership with FIAS Alliance New York, the Passive House Guide highlights the innovations of passive house technology on the regional level, showcasing leading edge architecture and building techniques. The current issue is available via the link in the chat. Go chat, go, there we go. For those who don't know me, I'm Brian Mahoney, Editorial Director of Chronogram Media, and I will be loosely in charge of this afternoon's proceedings. This event scheduled for an hour will be brief, but I have no doubt it will be enlightening and hopefully can serve as a springboard for further discussion. The experts here today to talk to you about their passive house projects are Stephanie Bassler of River Design, North River Design Build, excuse me, Brian and Shetty of Ryan and Shetty Studio, Buck Moorhead of Buck Moorhead Architect, and Christina Griffin of Christina Griffin Architect Studio. They'll each give a brief presentation, complete with delightful visuals, and then we'll have a Q&A. Um, I would also encourage everyone, while they're giving their presentations, if you have questions for them, as they're presenting, please feel free to drop those questions in the chat. Uh, I wanna dive right into the presentations, but first, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, number one, you all look like a well-behaved group, so I'll leave it at this. Normal Zoom etiquette applies. Please keep yourself on mute for the duration of the event. If you have questions, comments, or resources to share, just drop them in the chat window. Um, Department of Shameless Self-Promotion, uh, this year, 2023, is the 30th anniversary of Chronogram Media. Uh, what began in 1993 as just a couple of 20-somethings printing out a gussied up zine has become a media empire. I mean, all right, empire, maybe not. Uh, you must forgive me, I have a weakness for hyperbole. Suffice it to say that uh, it's no small feat to run an independent media company and have it survive and thrive for 30 years. We're proud of the work we do. We're grateful to be here. And we couldn't do it without all of the creative folks who live and work in the Hudson Valley and make it an amazing place. Um, speaking of magazines, did you know that you can receive in the mail each month or each quarter these beautiful magazines? Not only are they gorgeous objects, they are filled with information that will enrich your life. Do not deny yourself this any longer. And best of all, they don't require recharging. Once they're made, all they need is light. They're kind of like passive houses. Subscribe via the link in the chat. Way to go, Margo. Also, um, a heads up to all the architects, builders, designers, and other creatives on this call. Upstate House and Chronogram are dedicated to showcasing the creativity and innovation of the Hudson Valley. If you've got a project the world needs to know about, shoot me an email with the details, brian at chronogram.com. Tell me about what you're doing. We would love to showcase it in our publications. Uh, and a note of thanks to John Lorcher and the board at FIAS Alliance New York for their ongoing partnership in creating the Passive House Guide. Uh, and now um, our sponsors. None of this would be possible without support. Thanks to the sponsors of this year's Passive House Guide, New Energy Works, and River Architects. Here to talk to us a little bit about what they do is Brian Blyer of New Energy Works. Hey, y'all, I'm going to try to keep it real quick. Uh, I know there's a, a, a great session ahead. Um, my name, as Brian mentioned, is Brian uh, with New Energy Works. Um, we are an employee-owned company uh, with, with shops here in Rochester, New York, where I'm located today, and out in Portland, Oregon. We had started as a timber frame company back in the 80s as part of the resurgence of the traditional post and beam construction industry, and have really been passionate about all things wood ever since. Uh, in an effort to get timber frames dried in as quickly and efficiently as possible, we began panelizing enclosure work in the early 90s, and we, we found that our, our level of um, experience with the planning and coordination that, that goes into timber framing, it put us in a really good position to, to really excel at panelized enclosure work. We followed our, our timber frames around with, with increasing numbers of enclosures each year until we decided to make it a business of its own a few years ago. We've coined the operation HPEZ as an acronym for High Performance Made Easier. As the name of the operation suggests, 
Our entire goal is to make building better enclosures easier for those who may not otherwise have the time, experience, or labor to do so. Through our virtual design and construction process, or the VDC process, we build a digital model of the entire enclosure, which allows us to coordinate with clients using 3D models, shop drawings, in, in an effort to really vet a project prior to nailing a single piece of wood together. Once the VDC process is complete, we're ready to start in on fabrication. Where we, excuse me, <clears throat> we begin building panels in our shop where we've got some really great technology to assist. You can see in the center of the page here, some of our, a picture of our shop where we've got some of our equipment shown. We've got an optimizing saw, which cuts framing packages to approximately 90% optimization. We've got framing tables to help us frame, sheet, and route panels, and a set of butterfly tables to help us easily flip panels around for, for additional detailing. At the end of the day, all the fancy equipment is just another tool in our tool belt, but it does help achieve extremely precise and high quality panels. Everything we do here at New Energy Works has an underlying theme towards sustainability. We use FSC certified material. We use rigid wood fiber for our continuous outboard insulation layer and we pre-insulate cav cavities using hemp bat insulation. Later this year, we're gonna be getting into uh, dense pack wood fiber insulation and really couldn't be more excited about that. Once panels are built and ready for site, we're happy to supply panels for installation by others or we do offer installation services. My favorite approach, however, is, is sending out a consultant to work with on-site labor in the interest of training local crews so that we can, down the line, send panel packages out. Uh, for us, it really comes down to you know, developing those re long-lasting relationships. Anyways, don't please, please don't hesitate to reach out with any, any questions. I uh, would love to hear from you. And uh, I'd love nothing more than, than to chat on sustain, sustainability and high performance building. Uh, thanks, thanks again for having me on and I look forward to the rest of the presentation. Awesome, thanks, Brian. Um, You're welcome. We've, we've, we've featured a number of new Energy Works projects in Upstate House um, and I love the work you guys do, so thanks. Um, all right, we're going to really start the program now. Let's get to why we're here. And I'm not going to sit here and waste our time prattling on about how the passive house construction standard is the most rigorous, energy efficient set of performance based building technologies currently available. I'm going to let Stephanie Bassler talk for a little while. Um, Stephanie is a certified passive house consultant and a, an architect with North River Design Build. Uh, she is an expert in energy efficient building design and a certified passive house consultant. As North River's principal architect and a founding member of North River Design Build, her work has included large scale master planning and development projects, numerous net zero and passive house residential designs, the passive house certified women's leadership center at the Omega Institute, and a lead certified multi-floor renovation for Eileen Fisher in New York City. Baston Farm, a recent passive house project of North River Design Build was featured in the 2023 Passive House Guide. And Stephanie will be talking to us about that. Please, Stephanie, allow me to be quiet. A rare moment, Brian. Thanks so much for the intro. Um, really great company to, uh, to join here um, in this uh, panel discussion. I hope we can have some uh, fun q and I understand that um, all are welcome to submit questions during the presentation. and. Um, do I have it right, Brian, that we'll be um, answering during our time? Uh, yes, if you if you think uh, that there's something that is relevant for you to uh, speak to from someone's question, please do. If not, we can save it to the end. Okay, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, but uh, I may have to wait till the end of my, my um, piece here. Um, thanks so much for this opportunity. I, um, I'm really excited to share some of our work um, that we've been doing uh, with, at North River in the past couple of years and just to talk about our approach to passive house design and to our projects generally um, and um, just share what we think is um, an obvious move for uh, design and construction um, and has been for a while uh, in terms of energy efficiency. Um, passive house is demonstrably um, uh, 
it's a demonstrable improvement over code compliant construction, not just for reasons of energy efficiency, but also for um, the the durability of the of the build, the comfort of living and and working and using these homes and and buildings, um, and uh, obviously the investment is one that is meant to be returned to you and um, in spades and. Uh, we we believe in the work, and we're um, we're just uh, really proud to be to be able to um, to share. And uh, I'll start with this slide, which is the Baston Farm project. This is uh, a great view of the projects, just as they were um, completing construction. There are a few um, a few pieces still to be done, um, but it captured the work uh, in this. Uh, snowless winter. <laughs> so I think this is taken, this shot was taken in um, February and uh, really uh, missed the snowpack on the ground, but we were able to get uh, what looked like a, an early spring shot as a result. So you're seeing um, two homes here. These were built on about 20 acres of land that we, uh, North River, um, uh, purchased in 2020 and subdivided. and. Um, as a, a, a speculative effort to um, to offer our um, our take on the an, an optimized passive house home to for single family um, buyers in the region and um, just to pause for a minute on what 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 we're what we're proposing here with these homes. These are these designs are part of what we we're calling our flex house series and uh, flex houses are um, if you can go to the next slide Marco. Uh, a quick view of the two houses um, the these are obviously of the same character and um, uh, share a lot of features their footprints are pretty much the same um, and interior planning follows similar principles of which I can show you when we get to some views of the plan, of the floor plans. Um, but uh, as as flex houses, these are part of a series of designs that we're we've developed to offer to our our clients and um, to offer to really the community as an example of of a, a simple and cost effective build that um, that is meant to optimize the investments that our our clients and and any builder of a home would make in in their uh, in, in building a new house which is understandably a substantial undertaking and so we want we want the um, we want the resources in any construction and design to go where where it's meaningful and in this case um, we're paying attention to passive house it's it's uh, it focuses on the envelope it focuses on the orientation of the buildings. Both of them have great uh, south-facing facades here that you're looking at. And um, by by dialing down the complexity of these designs, we're we're dialing up the access to the um, the uh, wall assemblies, the insulation, the airtight construction, and uh, going to the architecture. Some of the special features of material selections and um, detailing, which aren't necessarily passive house per se, but are just part of what we want to offer as um, uh, a, a design focused architecture that is um, livable and resilient and um, pays attention to the patterns of living that uh, people are expecting in their homes these days. And those patterns of living have uh, come into focus pretty clearly for us at North River in the COVID era, as our community and uh, people who are wishing to move to the Hudson Valley are using their homes in a, um, a, a kind of overlapping way where uh, living and working and even learning, um, which I've experienced myself with uh, kids in school during COVID, has to happen and has to be accommodated in the same spaces. And it's no, uh, I, I wouldn't presume to say it's a great revelation that an open plan is um, conducive to these overlapping uses, but 
you know, we're, we're, we're providing it and we're paying attention to what that means while also creating um, the, the um, privacy and separation of uses that uh, will allow for, you know, people to have a home office or to uh, homeschool if need be, or to uh, work, um, or to just enjoy your home with a variety of, of generations of people who have different um, preferences for activities. So you'll see that a little bit in the uh, images and the plans that I'll show you in, um, as we look through. Margo, you can go on, please. So this is a, just a quick snapshot of the Flex House series. Um, this is uh, something that you can see on our website, um, nriverarchitecture.com. Um, you can just pay, uh, click on the Flex House tab and, and these are links that will get, get you to more information about um, what these houses are and what, what, what they're intended to be. But we it, it's almost like an evolution of our, of our uh, uh, design history where the first, um, uh, the, the first Flex House, I mean, uh, kind of backwards, but the first Flex, Flex House that we built as a residential project after the Omega Institute was the Flex House 4. And that's uh, 20, about 2,900 square feet of living space. Um, and the next one that we built or designed was the Flex House 1. And uh, since then, we've developed uh, 2 and 3. And these are sort of, you know, stretch them out, make them longer, stretch them tall, make them taller. Um, very simple construction and, and simple design iterations that uh, start from a, a, a baseline, you know, our, our base model and uh, are very understandable to anyone who wants to talk about, hey, I'd like to talk to you about a new home. I'm interested in passive house. I'm interested in net zero, carbon neutral design, all electric homes. What, what are you doing? And we can say, well, I mean, look, these are simple homes. They're typically uh, gable, which means that sort of barn shape to, to the structure without a lot of um, uh, complexity in them. And, um, we make them interesting and we're focused on some fun on design elements and um, we are looking to deliver them at the least possible cost and here's how we do that. And um, by incorporating as a, as a design build business a couple of years ago, we have been able to deliver our projects um, and as a continuum from uh, architectural design through uh, uh, turnkey delivery of the projects. And, um, I have found it a really natural fit for our skill set, and, and we're um, a team of about 15 people now um, in design and construction, and we're looking at building uh, six of these flex houses this year. So it's been um, uh, a, a really um, resonant opportunity for us as we um, uh, have have had a lot of interest in what we're doing. So I, I realize I'm taking a little bit more time and I wanted to go through the slides uh, quickly, Margot, to finish up because no one, no one's showing me the red card, but I think I'm, I'm feeling it. Um, these are a couple of slides showing the floor plans. Um, if uh, you can have a look at the uh, top, the top side of the floor plan is the north side. Um, Passive House 101 will have you load up the utility spaces on the north side and have living spaces on the south side. It's a, um, it, it, it's just an obvious way to enjoy um, uh, daylighting and in living spaces, and it helps us achieve the solar gains that we need to minimize the energy needs of the home. Next, Marco. Uh, this is the Baskin Farm North. Again, they're very similar plans. They just have been um, uh, modified for the particular needs of our clients. But they follow the same Part T, which is the uh, um, which is what I just described, and the open plan is um, uh, on the first floor for the living, dining, and kitchen spaces. Um, next slide. I wanted to share a few shots in construction. This is what our projects look like when we're building. Um, this is really the the fun part, and we open our our projects to um, community tours and to professional tours. And we had one in June. Um, with, uh, um, sponsored by the FIAS Alliance New York chapter and had a great showing of these projects as the walls were open and we were able to show all of the insulation, the careful attention to air tightness and the ventilation system ductwork um, as it was visible and 
really understandable. Um, and 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 uh, honestly, um, a, a pretty simple build that we hope that could be demonstrated that uh, any good builder could accomplish and and end up with excellent results and and a certifiable passive house. Next slide. Um, so after the that fun messy part, we um, deliver projects that look like this to our clients, and, and these are some examples of some of the materials and um, a focus on detailing that our our team delivers, and um, we consider as important as the energy efficiency. Next slide. Uh, similar use of of uh, accent materials where. Um, they have a lot of impact and also high touch areas like stairways. We typically use some wood paneling or wood planks so that they hold up over time and don't need the, um, you know, a lot of maintenance to, to keep up. Um, the, the floor that you're looking at there is an exposed concrete slab, which is typical for our project. Um, it, it is the foundation of the building and it's um, simply troweled after pour and um, that's the surface that you walk on. It's comfortable, it's not cold, um, and we think it has a great studio vibe to it. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a few shots of the open house tour, the CS Alliance tour that we had last summer. Um, and we were sharing um, our experiences, John Marshall there in the middle, and uh, William Dunwoody is one of our project managers on the left. Uh, each offering their perspective. Um, William as a, a on the build side, John is our energy modeler for our projects. Um, and um, I was sharing uh, some of the aspects of the um, energy efficiency of the homes, which um, will we'll end up using about a third of the energy of a code component home. Next slide. Um, this is the last slide and it's a, a, a view of the Patagonian Valley in Chile, and we're landing here far from the Hudson Valley um, because uh, we're um, looking at what's next for North River. And uh, North River is actually named after the Hudson River. We're uh, re regionally uh, rooted and committed to um, uh, excellence in design and energy efficient um, building construction in this area. And uh, we're, we, we have an opportunity to take that same um, uh, intention and um, share the passive house performance standard with a, uh, um, a client in Chile and are excited to share that um, possibly a next opportunity with a chronogram or some other professional audience. Um, it's uh, really exciting work in uh, Latin America. And I, I think proves how wider reach and how um, uh, uh, resonance and impact the passive house design standard has worldwide. Um, one of the focuses of uh, FIAS and of um, any, any energy efficient um, um, uh, standard or, or um, uh, advocacy group is the scalability of the efforts. Uh, we design our projects house by house, but we understand our position relative to how to make change in the building environment and how to do the best work that um, makes the difference that we need it to um, for climate um, health and resilience over the long term. So um, we're looking in, in, in terms of scaling at um, uh, a, an even lower cost option, which we're calling shell house, which distills these intentions down to an, an entry level um, option of a flex house. And um, we're also uh, planning a reopening of our storefront in Stone Ridge as, as a um, demonstration showroom for our designs and our efforts in, in construction of passive houses um, featuring these all electric homes. So. Uh, Again, looking for all opportunities to share and to learn together, and this being one of them. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. I think um, that I myself might have to uh, chronicle the Patagonian project and uh, head down there and uh, see for myself. <laughs> what... you, and me, you and me both, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were just a couple questions in the uh, in the chat. Um, the square footage of the homes, they were about 2,500 square feet each, if I recall. Yeah, that's right. 
Mm -hmm. And so that would, that would be like what the flex house three model. Is that what they were? Yep. Okay. Um, and then there was another question who funded these bills North river. Have they sold? Uh, we actually sold the land to the buyers um, prior to construction. So these were um, homeowner funded. Mm. I'll, I'll put a shout out to um, Ulster Savings Bank, which has been an excellent lender to our clients and have been very responsive to uh, the economics of a passive house build. That's great. And I really appreciate you you saying that. I think um, and maybe funding is something we might discuss um, after um, the presentations. And so thank you, Stephanie. Sure. Um, uh, up next, uh, Buck Moorhead, founding principal of Buck Moorhead Architects. Buck Moorhead Architect is a full-service architectural firm headquartered in New York City, specializing in high-performance and passive house building design. He is also principal architect for and partner alongside industry experts Greg Hale and Peter Malik in Regen Associates, LLC, which is currently undertaking the Catskill Project, a 120-acre 18 home single family residential development project in Livingston Manor, Sullivan County, for all who don't know, which was featured in the 2023 Passive House Guide. Buck, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, thank you, thank you, Brian, and, and thank you, Chronogram, for organizing this uh, and sponsors for sponsoring. This is a wonderful and essential educational effort around passive house and carbon neutrality. The Catskill Project's mission is carbon neutral development on a community scale, specifically as a working prototype for the decarbonization of single family housing in a rural environment. Passive house level design and construction provides zero or near zero operational carbon. In addition, and equally important, the Catskill Project is tracking the embodied carbon of our building materials, pushing that as close to zero as we can. This, this is a work in prog progress. Next slide, please, Margo. Our first phase is 11 lots on 90 acres. We have a 40 acre common property with a pond, waterfalls, and a hiking trail. Phases two and three will add six and eight lots respectively, totaling ultimately 25 uh, lots between all three phases. The project prohibits fossil fuel for heating, cooling, cooking, and hot water. We are all electric uh, at, at, every, at every house. Uh, next slide, please. This is our first model. It's called the Balsam. We decided early that we wanted to partner with uh, the panel manufacturer Bensonwood out of New Hampshire. We studied the models that they offer through their Unity Homes program. We studied, studied their typical wall and roof sections. We learned the key parameters to design within their system. Our balsam design is the result of that effort. It is a three bedroom plus office uh, house. It has two and a half bathrooms. It has a double height space in the Southwest corner, a future three season room and two, two upper decks. It's uh, 2,268 square feet. It can be fabricated by Benson Wood efficiently because we have respected and integrated their system within its design. Uh, we have, according to Ted Benson, uh, colored within the lines. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I have to go to my next slide. <laughs> uh, this is our wall and roof section. Uh, the wall is a two by 10 at 24 inch on center with dense packed cellulose. It has wood fiberboard and a SEGA Madge vest fabric at the exterior. There's an OSB air control layer designated by that red line as passive house enthusiasts know, understand. There's a two by three uh, interior utility wall that's inside of that, which is also insulated. This is about an R47 wall. The roof is 16 inch TJIs at 24, has, has an OSB air control layer, and it, it has a two by eight uh, utility space that's also insulated, giving us about an R80 approximately roof insulation. Our foundation is a warm form 
insulation system that's under the slab and under our structural haunch. Uh, next slab, uh, slide, please. Uh, these are some of the thermal bridge models that we did in the process of filing for our certification. We're a PHI is the application we've made, which is under their low energy building uh, model. Uh, these were required by PHI uh, in that certification process. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is an image showing some additional insulation uh, at the windowsill on the exterior. Benson Woods wall and roof sections are very robust uh, systems, though not necessarily attentive to potential thermal bridges at window and door installations that may be issues in passive house level construction. Uh, these window and door installations are completed at the factory. At the model home, uh, which that photograph is of, with the goal of passive house certification, we address the over insulation details to mitigate those bridges in the field. For the two subsequent builds that we have under construction now of the balsam, Benson Wood has worked with us to uh, add some of the over insulation that we did in the field to, to complete that insulation within their factory. Uh, next slide, please. These are images from the Benson Wood factory. Uh, they also show the assembly of site, this structure, that upper right hand image that it, in three to four days, it goes from all the panels are on flatbed trailers to four guys and a crane erecting the entire structure. Uh, and then uh, within a week or so, all of the interior non-load bearing walls are, are assembled as well. Uh, this panels come uh, with insulation, with windows already installed. And at the end of that week and a half or so they spend on site, uh, they're required by contract to deliver a 0.6 air barrier uh, result at 50 Pascal. In this case, the model tested at 0.43 when Benson would left the site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, shading design is critical to prevent passive houses from overheating while still allowing solar heat gain when you want it and need it. This is particularly uh, uh, tricky in shoulder seasons as well. We manipulated the architectural form in a subtle but essential manner in the southwest corner to mitigate solar gain through the large south facing and particularly the, the large west facing windows. The black tapered form provides deep horizontal shading as well as vertical shading fins. Here also is a uh, the fixed shading at the south windows. We modeled the house throughout the year to optimize the length of the fixed shades. Uh, next slide, please. Here is our PHPP model for low energy buildings. Uh, we wanted to check the resiliency of our design. We are, as I stated, an all electric, no fossil fuel house. We wanted to know how the house would perform if we lost power for several days, which in rural areas, as we know, can, can happen for several days or a week at a time periodically. This uh, the diagram on the upper right shows that that red line is our inside temperature. We shut the heat off for six days in the winter of 2022. Uh, and that for two of the days, it was the low was zero and one was day was minus 10. And the house never dropped below 50 degrees. I'm, I'm imagining some people on, on, the, on this panel have gone through similar tests for themselves, but it's remarkable how resilient these passive houses are. Uh, next, please. Uh, as mentioned before, Passive House addresses operational carbon. The embodied carbon of our building materials is equally important to address. When high carbon materials are used in large quantities, it can take decades, literally decades, to get back to a zero starting point, even with a passive house. It is extremely important for architects, 
owners, builders, and developers to be aware of this and make material selections accordingly, particularly for those materials which are used in large quantities in your projects. For instance, in the, uh, the structure, the insulation and facade materials. We have been tracking the embodied energy of building materials in EC3 starting in 2019. The world of carbon tracking is imperfect and evolving and somewhat difficult to ascertain. There are some new tools. Uh, Chris Magwood has been doing great work on this front. Overall, the Catskill project and the, and the Balsam models well with respect to embodied energy. The shell, its structure and insulation and siding are generally wood-based. Our, our less successful materials are concrete is not good. Uh, generally, and uh, in our next models, we we hope to employ concrete with fly ash, which is helpful. Also, our under slab ins insulation is rigid foam, also not good. Uh, we hope to uh, incorporate a uh, gravel, that new product coming out of uh, Vermont, which would be helpful with respect to that. Uh, next slide. Here are some slides of of some of our materials choices. Our our siding is, is a green hemlock siding. Uh, it is an untreated rain screen. Below that is, is a Koopa clad siding, which is a non-combustible. Uh, it's a, a slate stone that's modular and is completely removable and reusable, which is it's, it's an out of Europe idea concept. And uh, uh, they're designing, you know, materials and systems that are completely demountable so that all, you know, you can build a building and ideally reuse all of the materials that you put into that, into that building. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here shows some of our interior uh, products that are used. We, we have site harvested uh, cherry wood on the ceilings. We've got soft maple wood, again, site harvested. Uh, on wall finishes and we, we employ ash flooring as well. The counters are rich light, which is a, a resin infused compressed paper. Uh, the stick bill light fixtures are use re, reclaimed hard pine and our tiles, fire clay tiles are certified climate neutral. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide identifies our project team and uh, many thanks to our consultants and contractors listed there. We currently have two balsams that are under construction now. Uh, the Catskill project will be bringing model four, a slightly smaller vernacular farmhouse form onto the market this spring. And I, I didn't look at a single ch chat question because I wanted to read through quickly <laughs> what I had to say, but I'm, you know, if there's time, I'd be happy to answer questions now. Or, or later in the program. Uh, th thanks, uh, Buck. That was really uh, great. Uh, some some joker was wondering if that was a cannabis plant in one of those uh, photos. That was the only uh, question we got uh, in there. Um, but I have a question for you. So um, you mentioned that the one house is built and then two others are under construction. What's what is the uh, the pace of the project rolling out? How is that? How how are you handling that? Well, the, the pace is, is much slower than we would hope for, and we're handling it painfully, to be frank. I mean, it's, we've been, the model we constructed during the pandemic, which was an exercise and challenge in and of itself. And uh, we, we had two sales uh, shortly after, model, after the model was completed, which are the ones we're building now. But then uh, we got hit the, uh, uh, you know, the cost of construction in general, ramping up like hurt us to begin with, but then the, the cost of money in the mortgage world has seriously impacted, uh, you know, our traffic to the site. So uh, we're optimistic, though. Now we we have, we think with the the smaller model that we can bring a a, a passive house level structure in at a at a lower price point, which will bring more potential buyers and. Uh, but we're we're very very happy with the product. We get nothing but high grades with respect to the quality of the model itself, and people are excited. This is the only 
project that we're aware of that's that's this fully committed to zero carbon, a non-fossil fuel in the Northeast. And it may be, we've asked, uh, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's aware of one, we'd love to know about it, but we have an HOA that prohibits fossil fuel. You know, you can't do it in, in that. And so we're not, and we're up requiring that not every house has to be certified, but it has to be effectively built, you know, to certify uh, the same standards, you know, that would be certified. So that's, well, that, that's amazing. And I, I look forward to tracking this project as it rolls out. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Buck. All right, um, Ryan and Shetty healing it. Ryan and Shetty Studio is an architectural practice based in Brooklyn, working to create poetry from solutions adapted to climate and existing built conditions. Technical areas of expertise include ultra low energy passive house construction, sunlight harvesting for daylighting, rooftop solar, and renovation of existing buildings. Additional areas of focus include passive conditioning, climate responsive design, and building integrated vegetation. Ryan believes these techniques can be shaped into a new language of beauty and pleasure, which can turn, which can in turn facilitate returned intimacy with nature in our experience of the built environment. In the 2023 Passive House Guide, we featured Groundworks, a Passive House retrofit and gardener designed by Ryan. Ryan, it is your time. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um, the, so the project that um, I was honored to have included is um, uh, been dubbed by the owners Groundworks Studio. It's an adaptive reuse of a small garage building uh, on a farm in Gardner. This is the site. Uh, Gardner is off to the right there a bit, and the, uh, the gunks are to the west, northwest. Um, that's the, the site in the middle. And it was purchased by a couple who I've known a long time. Um, they, and they're with the purpose of creating a, uh, a retreat center that they can use as a venue. They want to be able to offer it in support of people doing a range of work that they feel is important, um, a private place, but with a kind of a public mission. The, if you go to the next slide, if please. So the, the property is, um, it was a farm. The, it, and it has, it came with a, a good size house and a number of kind of rust, rough outbuildings. And what they needed to start was a, a meeting hall or a gathering space for this, um, for this uh, place that they're, they're creating. And there's a, there was a, an existing farm garage, which is in the center of that circle there, which was the obvious, uh, the obvious candidate for uh, conversion. Next slide. That's what we started with. Um, next, that's the exterior. That was the interior. It, um, it was a, it's a pretty simple little uh, co concrete block box. There was, there's three big garage bays. There's an apartment in one end. There's these big steel beams. And the, um, next slide please. We spent, um, so equally important to creating this, this, um, this place was, you know, it, as, they're as they're starting to change this farm into a retreat center, equally important was to establish the spirit that they wanted with this place. So they, they brought some design ideas, they brought a mission statement, um, I took those, I brought some thinking about things like relation to the landscape, to the sun, uh, to the contemporary agricultural context. But above all, really, certainly for me, I think for, for all of us, the goal was to give some expression to the feeling that they wanted, that they were communicating to me about what they wanted this place to be. So we did some writing, looked at some imagery, some of this, some of that's what you see here. Next slide. Working with that little garage building, which had a pretty, a good shell and, but some strong, um, you know, had those beams and windows. 
we landed on the idea of a, a pretty simple, obvious multi-purpose central hall, removing the ceiling uh, and using the geometry of what was there to create a, uh, a, a nine square, if you go to the next slide, a nine square grid pattern using the existing beams and making some faux beams to, uh, to contrast. And the goal was to really create a strong centered internal space that's still open and flexible, hopefully not too dogmatic, and balancing what is really essentially a, an internally purposed space, almost, uh, almost with a cloistered character, with a connection to the outside, right? There's beautiful, I mean, the, the spot is beautiful, and there's, there's actually different views in every direction that are all kind of uniquely nice. Um, so if you go to the next slide, the um, we did that with a combination of openings around the outside set together with this nine square grid idea. This is the floor plan. Next slide. This is, of course, the interior under construction. Um, next slide. This is what it looked like about six months ago, nine months ago. Next slide. And that's kind of where we've ended up with one of those views. And that to me, that combination of a strong internal centered space that is kind of flexible, that's balanced with these views to the outside is, is I think, uh, the biggest success of the project. It's certainly the, the part that I'm the most proud of. Uh, next, please. At the, ex at the outside, we layered on an idea of these light monitors, creating, um, we took the existing ceiling out so that the, the um, above that grid is open to the underside of the roof through the, uh, the light wood trusses. So we wanted to bring light into that upper part of the volume. Um, and also just candidly, it, it, it gives the building a little bit of a presence. It creates, begins to create a bit of an emblem um, out of this otherwise pretty simple shed. The, um, and then at the, if you go to the next slide, at the south facing side, the, the whole farm is laid out on a pretty rigid orthogonal grid, which is sort of arbitrary. I guess it, it points at the ridge line, uh, but it's pretty. It's a pretty dominant. Um, uh, it uh, adds a pretty dominant, dominating character to the to those buildings and creating a little bit of a cut to those begins to, and also in some of the landscaping work, which isn't, uh, isn't yet built, begins to, I hope, introduce uh, to begins to be able to create an opportunity to break that down. And it also, it, it hopefully adds a little bit of a character to the emblem of those, the emblematic quality of those light monitors, um, a little hint that there's something else that's important here. Next slide. So we, I guess, actually go back, if you don't mind, speaking to the, uh, to the technical aspects, we we wrapped the, we did what you know you often do with a masonry building. You put a stove stove coat, an air barrier, liquid applied air barrier on the outside. Uh, that gentleman there, Mike Leonard, is responsible for um, this project. <laughs> he's that's he's the man. Um, he made this thing tighter than any of us had ever uh, tested before uh, on his first time out. Uh, Next, because we it was we peeled everything out of it, so we insulated it over the outside. We did we bounced it was during COVID, so we bounced around a little bit about how to do that, what was available. Rock wool was really hard to get. We ended up with um, a, a, obviously a substantial cavity, uh, which we filled with cellulose. That's what you see here, obviously on the roof. Next. Then we enclosed it. That's Mike um, again with uh, George Cantos, whose company did the siding. Next. And here's George's siding going on. The windows are aluminum from Poland, provided by Icon, which I've been very happy with and I'd be happy to recommend. Next. And that's where we ended up now. Um, the next, what next step is to do the, we're working on the landscaping around the building. Nice, thank you, uh, 
Ryan, um, somebody posted a question um, wondering if the uh, homes are solar powered. There's no uh, solar power on on this on Groundworks, right? There's some. There's some. If you go back to the site plan, you can see that they had some, they, the farm came with some existing solar arrays. Um, they haven't done a ton yet to the really the main occupied building is the house, which is big and crazy drafty um and very much not solar powered i guess they they did put in mini splits that's you know probably phase two um as they go along um but this so this building was just um the uh the first step and there's, there's no solar panels dedicated to this building although there may be at some point i don't know i hope that answers the question uh yeah and then there's a question about who you worked with who did the build so um, so the owner's brother did the build. Mike Leonard is his name. And I'd be happy to, um, whatever way convenient connect. I'd, I'd, uh, the, the heating, I can, you know, I'm happy to uh, pass along all the names. Uh, John Wurcher was involved. Kramer of Silkworth um, were involved on the design side. Uh, George Contos, of course, as I mentioned in Sagarty, in, in uh, Poughkeepsie, I think, did the uh, the metal work. Um, uh, Rycorb did the mini splits. It's a Zender a ERV, which which Mike Mike did. Really, it was Mike that did did. It's really Mike's baby, and 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 Frank and Kristen's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It's an unusual project. It's kind of a family affair, which which was super lovely. Um, and also came with its own challenges, I suppose. But it was a really lovely way. To, it was a really lovely way to work. It still is. It's a really lovely way to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then last question: uh, What's the mechanical system for this project? There's there's three Mitsubishi uh, ductless mini splits. Awesome. It's it's there's not a lot of load in that building. It's right. A, it's actually a pretty discreet little building. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's just just basically one open space. It's it's kind of a box, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Sure, my pleasure. Um, all right, Christina Griffin. Uh, Christina Griffin Architect Studio is an award-winning architectural design firm providing innovative, timeless, and uplifting design throughout the Hudson Valley for the past 31 years. The firm has extensive experience creating thoughtful design within the residential, commercial, and public sectors with a recent focus on sustainability and net zero energy projects. Uh, Forever House, the passive house that Christina built for herself in Hastings on Hudson, was featured in the 2023 Passive House Guide, and uh, Christina will be talking about that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to Chronogram for inviting me to this event. I'm, I'm really delighted, and I'm excited to share these ideas with, uh, with the public. Um, I, I recently built this house. It is... Um, a passive house certified DOE uh, zero energy house. Um, it also, of course, has to meet Energy Star and um, Indoor Air Plus uh, standards. Um, our firm has been working on lots of old st structures because we're in a pretty dense uh, suburban area here. Uh, and I wanted very much to set an example for how you can retrofit an old home that's very, that's on the small side. Uh, so uh, as my, uh, this is a house that I built to downscale, um, the kids are grown, decided that uh, it would be a demonstration house and it would hit all the high standards. And it would be in a neighborhood right next to other houses that are very similar in size. Um, this is the final product you're seeing in this image here. And we added the addition to the right and that gave the uh, house a little more space. It used to be under a thousand square feet and the uh, previous owner raised four children in the house. Uh, and I'm a great believer that smaller homes really help reduce your carbon footprint. So, um, but we added some space so that we had a total of 1700 square feet in the house. And we have a lot of like areas that rooms that are really de definitely flex space. They're, either bedroom one week and the next week their um, exercise areas. And this is the front of the house with spacious south. So we have a porch and we have trellis to help with shading. You can see the wonderful shadows uh, from the sun, uh, shade that uh, really does result from doing this. And we use uh, 
solar shading studies to come up with the right angles to make that happen. So, um, and then you see this garden that wraps around the house. It's all, um, all uh, native plants. Um, so um, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. Um, so I, I have um, decided that this house, our, our smaller home, uh, without the kids would be a demonstration house. And I actually have been uh, giving uh, talks about the house and have opened it to tours. One was with Theus at their 2021 conference and um, to show how you can use an old housing stock and you can meet these really high standards. There's so much, so many existing buildings in, in Westchester in the New York area. And um, a lot of people or a lot of uh, are not aware how much you can upgrade and especially when it's time to upgrade um, to um, a very a much higher standard where we have uh, no fossil fuels we took out the oil tank we have um, you know windows facing mostly large windows facing south and so we completely rehabilitated this building but when I saw this building, this little house, I decided that we would not remove the basement. I did not want to tear everything down. I wanted it to be a very cost effective uh, project because cost is always an obstacle. When people hear a uh, passive house, they worry that it's just simply out of their budget. So we uh, saved the basement uh, foundation walls and we kept the basement out of the thermal envelope so that we would uh, wrap it all around the house um, and not use that space only for storage. Um, so anyway, this is where we started. Um, this is an adorable little house, but um, I'll show you the next slide, uh, please, how we completely um, changed the house by expanding it. This is the addition we put on and all the, um, this is, we're show, I'm showing you the Intello membrane on the inside, uh, our smart membrane, and between that membrane and the um, exterior um, weather membrane, we have uh, 12 inches of dense pack cellulose. Um, this is a double stud wall. Uh, I have, uh, I decided to keep costs down. I simply um, try to use the most cost-effective materials. And I also try to use uh, as many materials I could that were made in the US. The windows are Wyeth windows made in New Jersey. Um, and you're seeing right here, the windows facing south by design, of course, to get as much um, heat through the large windows. And the windows at the very end, the, the big sliding doors, they're facing northeast. And, when we design passive house projects, we use the Wolfie model to design the building. And the Wolfie model helps to tell us whether we get that energy balance um, by having some glass on the north and some on the south. And in this case, we were able to meet our target and have really nice glass doors on the back because it faces the backyard. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this is the exterior of the house. Um, we have deep overhangs to help shade the windows on the second floor, trellises over the south facing glass. We have southeast where we have the big windows on the uh, living room. We have uh, southwest over the front door. The porch also is a really important solar shading uh, device as well as a really sweet uh, feature. And almost every house on the block has a, a porch. Um, next slide, please. This is the north side. The north side is, has all the closets and the bathrooms and the mudroom are all located on this side. The smaller windows, um, the, you can see the little bit of the old basement that's a uh, foundation wall that's left in the old stone wall. We kept the old materials wherever we could. Um, next slide, please. This is a view just showing this. This, if you look at the corner, we um, picked up uh, the corner of the old house and um, we hung it from a beam so we could have a higher ceiling in the living room. And the house is laid out so that there is an open, uh, very large open music room, living room, kitchen, and there's a lot of flex space ideas where there's a little uh, pit stop for um, like a little home, uh, 
desk area off the open space. And then uh, behind this wall, I show you at the next slide, I think, please. Um, yeah, well, the, the wall that's opposite to the open space has a mudroom recycling center, um, a uh, uh, room closet, pantry, and half bath. And all of those items, because they're tucked in a core, they help allow this open space that wraps around it. Next slide, please. This is the open kitchen. These are these were purchased as unfinished white oak. Uh, they're white rift cut oak cabinets that were finished on site, so we could have a uh, VOC free finish. All the tile is porcelain with a, a kind of a uh, concrete. Uh, faux concrete look, but they're large pieces, very small joints for low maintenance. A lot of decisions were made very deliberately to allow um, uh, an older couple to live here. <laughs> um, and next slide, please. This is the um, the master or primary bedroom. Um, I'm showing this because um, the entire upper level is a cathedral ceiling, except there is a, a spine uh, over the, that is the hallway that has all the mechanical equipment, which is a very small 1.5 ton Mitsubishi heat pump. That's all we needed to heat this house. And also the Zender um, ventilation system. The uh, unit is inside the master, the primary uh, closet here and easily accessible to, to change all the filters. Um, and uh, as you can see, we have light, a lot of, lot of natural light. So that's um, very much um, daylighting is throughout the house that really helps to minimize the use of any um, artificial lighting. Next slide, please. And this is the house at night. This is, you can see the houses next door. They're very similar in scale um, and it fits right in, even though it has more of a modern look. This. Um, this uh, tall window that you see there, this is actually a, um, a two-story shaft. And this is here to allow for a lift in case we, uh, to just plan for the future for handicap accessibility. And then the front door, the whole house is settled, is, is set on the site. It was that way originally that allows handicap accessible with a ramped entrance to the front door. So aging in place is a really nice, feature of this house, but because it has uh, three, it has uh, three rooms upstairs, one his and her bath that could be converted into three bedrooms, two baths for a family one day. But the total floor area of this house is only 1700 square feet. And um, a, a lot of the houses on the block are very similar in size and you know, it's very comfortable and I'm now um, giving tours of the house and showing them how we made this house into zero energy passive house and uh, really getting a lot of uh, clients and, and friends that are getting uh, a lot of information and, and awareness about how we can reach this standard, even using a very, this old housing stock that we have here in Westchester. Thanks, Christina. Um, we, we, we have some questions. Um, your kitchen cabinets have developed a fan club over the course of your presentation. People are wondering um, <laughs> where, 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 whose cabinets are those? I went to Conestoga. They're one of the largest, um, uh, reach, uh, um, largest um, cabinet makers in the US. I'm actually deliberately trying to find American made materials wherever I could. And they um, usually only sell to the trade, um, but I, I help clients get these type of cabinets. You can get them unfinished and that way you can actually put a really good um, low VOC or, or no VOC finish on them, which is what I, uh, this is why I chose them. Mm -hmm. um... There was a question about the original house. Were there asbestos? Were those asbestos shingles on there? And if so, did you encapsulate yes. them? Yeah, they were removed, and they were they were um, removed uh, so that they were 
to a specific type of site that takes uh, asbestos siding. Okay. Um, another question, uh, what was the total cost per square foot of the project? <laughs> it's so funny. I, um, I, uh, I didn't expect that question, but I should have, I should have, uh, I should have. Um, I, I'm coming up with, um, hold on. It's the math. I understand. Math. It's, it's 347, 350 square feet. 350 square 300. feet. 300. Okay. Right. And then um, there's a question about, um, are there any tours scheduled for this spring or summer? People are wanting to get into your house. Well, we have a, a tour in Hastings on Hudson. I think um, I don't have the final date. Uh, it's part of their Earth Month um, events. Um, I, I think it's the uh, 29th. Um, I think uh, the village of Hastings will be um, have it on their website if anyone wants to look them up. Um, I'm giving a tour uh, throughout the day and in small groups, um, but um, you'll have to sign up for that if you're interested. That's awesome. Thank you, Christina. That's great. Um, how does it, um, you know, you built a, a home, you know, that you live in. How is the lived experience of your house? <laughs> um, well, it's, it's uh, that's a great question. Just, um, I, I find that sometimes um, uh, in the, in the winter time, I haven't even been, I, sometimes I don't have the heat on at all, you know, and in fact, uh, the heat is either is almost entire is off or almost off most of the time um and i'm very much aware of how many people are in the house because uh if you have a certain number of people and we also have pets um we actually turn the heat off uh, almost every time we have a group because they really help heat up the house i mean there's very little um heat um i i love it it's very comfortable ventilation is wonderful um you know, having that uh, fresh air exchange. Um, and of course, uh, all the daylight and the open space, even though it's a small house, we feel it's very open and airy. Mm -hmm. um, has living in a house that you've um, designed uh, given you any like thought about how you work as an architect building for other folks? Yes, I think that um, most people don't accept a small house like this. And I think the lesson learned for me and for that I would like to share that if you really are serious about reducing your carbon footprint, um, live with less floor area. Um, it's uh, not necessary to have 3000 square feet. Um, even and this house is set up for a young family in case we decide to sell it one day. And uh, I think that if you start with that, then the, then the money you think it will cost to do passive house is it, not as much as you think because it's just not a big house to begin with. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then our other panelists, there is a question if anyone uh, if you guys just want to pipe in about uh, how much per square foot your projects cost, if you have any idea about that. Um, oh, there's Stephanie jumped in there. Um, she was saying it's about 400 a square foot. Okay. Right. Uh, I guess, I guess, you know, size is, is relative, you know, 1700, you know, uh, might not be so small to uh, some folks. Um, um, all right. Uh, I, I said we were going to do this in an hour. We're a little over an hour. Um, I really appreciate um, our presenters today. Those were amazing. I loved all of those presentations. And I certainly want to come and take a tour of your house, Christina, see that thing. I mean, uh, just, I guess I have another, I mean, what did your neighbors think? It, you know, I guess it, you say it fits into the neighborhood, but the photos sometimes have this dramatic lighting that it looks like it's a spaceship landed from space. <laughs> Oh, the neighbors, neighbors are wonderful. They've been so welcoming to us. And they, they, um, they, they think, they often say it really fits in in scale and shape too, but if you, but not really in style. It has a front porch like all the other neighbors. 
And, you know, a lot of people think passive, uh, sometimes our clients will Google passive house and they see these very uh, stark uh, shapes. Um, and they're uh, fearful of that as well. You know, that the house is not looking um, like a traditional houses in the US. Um, and they think they're only modern. Well, this house is modern, but it also has the shape and roof configuration and scale of the older homes. Yes, um, totally agree. And Dan Levy piped in saying, you know, he was so pleased that you renovated in the neighborhood. And I think that, you know, that is really something that we could, you know, all, you know, do more with there. So, um, yes. And so somebody asked, will, right, this will be um, on our YouTube in uh, soon. So this will this will be ready to be shared with the universe. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Buck. Thank you, New Energy Works. Thank you, River Architects. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for reading Upstate House and Chronogram. Um, it was really great to have you all.